Hello, and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Expert Series. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media, and I am excited to be your moderator for this special event on architecting the enterprise for remote work, remote offices, and cloud data. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that come in. A Q&A panel is also the place to just say hello, which a lot of you have been doing already. We'd love to hear where you're logging in from. And it's also the place to let us know if we can help uh, in the unlikely event that you have any technical issues. A browser refresh will fix most issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. At the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Now, these expert series events are a special product neutral looks at pressing technology problems presented by an expert in the field. But the support of our sponsors make it possible for us to bring you this content. So we wanna give a special shout out to our sponsors. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna share some messages from our sponsors today. They'll refer to links that you can find in your handout section as well as on the slides. Um, and you can go into the handouts in your console at any time during the presentation to uh, check out those handouts. As always, the handout section also has a few valuable actual tech media links. There's a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to actual tech media's great printed resources on technology topics. There's also a link to the ATM Event Center, which has all of our um, single company presentations, our ecocasts, our megacasts, our vertical ecocasts, um, our panel casts, and more expert series events coming up like this one. So check out that calendar of events. Um, I'm sure there's something in there that uh, that will be of interest to you. Now, before we get to the main presentation, a few words from our sponsors. We are supported by Duo. Duo Security, now part of Cisco, is the leading multi-factor authentication and secure access provider. Duo, Duo comprises a key pillar of Cisco Secure's Zero Trust offering, the most comprehensive approach to securing access for any user, from any device, to any IT application or environment. And you can try it for free at duo.com. Today's event is also sponsored by Rubric. Companies around the world rely on Rubric, the pioneer in zero trust data security for business resilience against cyber attacks, malicious insiders, and operational disruptions. Rubric Security Cloud, powered by machine intelligence, enables their customers to secure data across their enterprise, cloud, and SaaS applications. They automatically protect data from cyber attacks, continuously monitor data risks, and quickly recover data and applications. And you can learn more at rubric.com slash ransomware. This event is also brought to you by Nasuni. Nasuni is a leading file data services company that helps organizations create a secure file data cloud for digital transformation, global growth, and information insight. The Nasuni file data platform is a cloud native suite of services offering solutions for user productivity, business continuity, data intelligence, cloud choice, and simplified global infrastructure. And there's a link there to learn more about Nasuni. And again, all of these links are available in your handout section. This event is made possible by Palo Alto Networks. Getting started with ZTNA 2.0 shouldn't be difficult, overwhelming, or come with compromises. It boils down to alignment, mapping needs to the key concerns or challenges you face, without requiring a massive architectural shift or business disruption. Join an upcoming workshop with Palo Alto Networks experts to get started on three key projects that will aid your ZTNA 2.0 implementation. And you can learn more at the link on your screen or in your handout section. And finally, this event is brought to you by Okta. From onboarding new users and responding to tickets to ensuring your organization is safe from cyber attacks, you probably don't have enough hours in the day to check off everything on your to-do list. 
So join Okta to see how a secure identity solution can give you the freedom to focus on your best work. And you can register in the link on the screen. Um, and that link is also in your handouts along with an Okta white paper on the key to effective work. So once again, take advantage of that handout section where you can find all the links that you've just seen, plus some of the others that, that uh, I told you about earlier. And before we get started, I do have one poll question for you here. So we here at Actual Tech Media are holding this poll to find out from you what companies you'd really like to hear from in the future. This is a long list, but if you could take a moment to check out all the companies you're interested in, we'd really appreciate it. So specifically, the poll is for upcoming multi-vendor data and analytics events, which of the following vendors should we invite on to demo their solutions? So we've got Click, Tableau, Looker, Zoho, SciSense, Alteryx, Ocean, Yellowfin, Domo, Microsoft Power BI, Yellowbrick Data, and SAP. So those are the companies there. I can see lots of responses coming in. Appreciate everybody who has responded. Again, click on as, as many of those as interest you, and I'll just leave that up there uh, for another minute um, to give you a chance to uh, to digest that list and uh, and click away. All right, response is still coming in. Really appreciate your feedback on this. It really helps us out in creating events that you will find valuable um, in the future, which is which is our goal to create events that that are valuable to you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close up that poll once again. Really appreciate everybody who responded to that. So let's get to it. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, to introduce in a, in a second here our, our presenter today. We have the one and only Howard M. Cohen. So Howard has tons of experience in the IT industry and the channel across technologies. And I work with Howard as often as I can book him uh, for events because he's such a great speaker. But rather than go through all that he's done, I'll just say this. What I really appreciate and value about Howard is his ability to think through big topics and provide a comprehensive, realistic, and valuable overview of any IT trend that intersects with business. And I think you're gonna find that Howard's got a lot of great insights about remote work, which is one of those big topics. Um, and I know I'm looking forward to sitting back and listening to you, Howard. Howard, welcome to the expert series. I appreciate you coming on. Well, Scott, I appreciate that introduction. Thank you. Uh, and welcome everybody. Um, Today's presentation, as Scott has already told you, is entitled Architecting the Enterprise for Remote Work, Remote Offices, and Cloud Data. Um, those of you who have attended any of my presentations in the past know that I like to start each presentation with a word of the day. Now, to get to today's word, we're going to have to go traveling through time a bit. We're going to roll all the way back 26 years ago, 29 years ago, excuse me to um, 1994, and uh, in 1994, a gentleman said to the world, work has become an activity, not a place. What he meant was we now don't go to work, we get to work without having to leave where we are, which sounded great. The gentleman, by the way, is Robert Frankenberg, who at that time was the chairman of Novell Corporation. And again, he did say this in 1994 at the Massachusetts Software Council meeting, work has become an activity, not a place. Unfortunately, eh, not so much. Uh, soon after he said it, it kind of fell away and we didn't hear about it anymore. The word that came out of it, which is today's word, is telecommuting. Now, many of you may never have heard anyone say telecommuting. Maybe you've heard people say telework, um, but we really don't use that term anymore. We haven't. And the problem right up front was that managers felt very strongly that there's no way they could manage their people 
if those people were in some remote location somewhere. Uh, they need to be in the office. They need to be where I can see them. And uh, telecommuting died a quick and unremarkable death. We just didn't hear about it anymore. For the next stage, we'll travel a little further back to the future, closer to now, and end up in the, in the year 2020. And of course, in March of 2020, you may remember that we were struck with a, a global pandemic. The COVID-19 virus has uh, covered the world. And this required us to undergo a global digital transformation. See, um, everybody working from home, that's a big challenge. All of a sudden, millions of people stopped going into the office and started working from home. Fortunately, those of us who listened to Robert Frankenberg were prepared a long, long time ago for this. And what we did, we didn't call it telecommuting. We didn't call it telework. We simply said we were gonna work from home. WFH, work from home. And that became the battle cry of March, 2020. Now this new work from home world created some new world challenges for us as well. Let's take a look at some of those. Well, the first one had to do with the big change, right? Here we were, we used to work in buildings like these, um, office buildings. And most everybody in our employ was in that building connected to our network through, in front of which we put a firewall and an intrusion prevention system and a whole bunch of other um, measures to make sure that the building was secure. The name of the game was to protect the threat surface. Sorry. To protect, let's try that again. To protect the threat surface. I'm not doing well, am I? Okay. so. The magic ring is supposed to represent a ring around the building that protects everybody in the building. Um, the threat surface, of course, also refers to a bunch of uh, digital realities, but for the sake of our presentation here today, the building represents the threat surface and everybody's in it together. So it's kind of easy to protect them all in one place. The threat surface, as you've already seen, changed pretty radically. Uh, the moment everybody started running home. Now, all of a sudden, we had a user sitting out here in Jersey and another one up in Northern Jersey and another one down in Jersey City. We had a few in Brooklyn. Um, I know we had one oh, living in Murray Hill and they were all over the place. We had users, users everywhere. And, then, and we had to protect them all. Another concern that came out of this big move to home had to do with data. Where are we going to store the data? In the past, we stored it in servers on site. Unfortunately, our own premises were compromised. We couldn't go there. We were not allowed to, we had a shelter in place. So everybody was staying home. Our Premises represented by the orange dot at the bottom were no longer the best possible choice. Now we could choose from putting our data in a public cloud somewhere, perhaps a private cloud that we had located somewhere or a hybrid of the two. So we could store the data in any of these clouds, but then how do we secure the data? You can store it, but can you secure it? And of course, by that time, people already knew that cloud was actually much safer than on-prem, but we won't dive too deeply into that argument. Another problem that was created in this new world was that literally everything became a potential threat. Our own networks were a potential threat because they were now stretched out all over the place. We had systems that were easily compromised because they were not protected by that big major firewall. We had applications that were being compromised. We had data files being compromised, corrupted, encrypted. Um, everything, everything had suddenly become much more of a threat than ever before. And while we're talking about securing everything, we also had to worry about our users, our people, and how are we gonna equip them to get their work done. 
to, to access the resources we were making available to them over the network and to keep in touch with each other, work together with each other and keep in touch with us. So these were all tremendous problems. And of course, we had that same age old problem that um, they faced back in 1994. Managers were still asking, how will I know they're working? You know, basically saying, my people are completely untrustworthy. If I'm not over there snapping the whip at them, well, no, seriously, there was always a big concern that people wouldn't be working if they were working from home. They would be watching TV. They would be having snacks. So that became a problem. This was all based on an age-old adage that the former shadow, the former shadow is the best fertilizer. That means that if the farmer can cast his shadow over a field, well, that field will grow, but it needs his shadow. I say that's hogwash, that's nonsense. Okay, we found many great ways of tracking work. As long as people stopped measuring the clock and started measuring results, the outcomes, the things that got done. But we'll talk more about that after we travel, this time right up to the present. Here we are in 2023, and we found out some really great things. First of all, we found out that people were really happy working from home. 97% of them, after it was all over, here we are in 2023, they still want to work from home, at least part time. They'd like to shuffle back and forth between the two if necessary, but Clearly, work from home was working for them. Of course it was. They didn't have to commute, which is miserable. They were spending less money on going out and buying lunch and on dry cleaning their clothes. Uh, it was less expensive. And, and this is the part that really got to everybody. They started working, most of them started working when they would ordinarily leave for work. Meaning that the entire time that they would commute, half an hour, an hour, more, they were working. And they wouldn't stop working until they arrived home, their you know, usual time to arrive home. So again, the commute coming back the other way, they were actually working more hours at a more relaxed way than they ever had before. And that created no surprise on the management side. As a matter of fact, 94% of managers surveyed tell us that productivity was at least the same, if not better when everybody was working, started working from home. So the employees like it, the employers like it. And by the way, the employers, 90% of them want to work from home at least part-time as well. So everybody suddenly liked working from home. Telecommuting, not so much. Working from home, that was the magic ticket. And so we take a look at how and what we had to do to get the world spinning once again in this working from home environment. First up, we had to worry about endpoint security. Every endpoint is now remote. Somebody's working on their laptop computer or a laptop they brought home from the office, or they're working on their kid's home computer. I mean, there were all kinds of uh, jury rigs at that point. People were working on whatever they can get their hands on. So we had to make sure that every endpoint could be secured. And this was not like BYOD, right? You bring your own device and IT is expected to secure it. No, IT was very specific about what you could and couldn't use. Now, IT really couldn't. IT really couldn't dictate what was acceptable and what was not. We needed to you know, do everything we could possibly do to make it possible for people to get to work from home. Some of those devices that they took home from work, they brought back if they left the company. Now those devices had to be recertified so that we were sure that they didn't do anything to it that made it unqualified to connect to the network. So that was a new process that had to be created. Then there was the problem of the devices themselves. You know that if they're using their own device, they have some personal data on it. Photographs of the kids, you know, contacts, what have you. And we needed them to have corporate data on there as well. The most important thing though, is that the two don't mix. 
So we actually had to build a firewall between the two. We had to create segments for each so that one could not bleed into the other because we didn't want people being able to take our corporate data and pull it into their own message, you know, messaging, their own SMS or their own email or their own whatever they use and send it to somebody they shouldn't be sending it to. That would overcome all of our security. So it was critical to put a firewall between the personal data and the corporate data. Not only the people involved, but also the, the, the devices themselves had to be authenticated. We had to make sure that the device was qualified to connect to our network, had sufficient security and so forth. So we went to new heights in network access control, which of course prevented unauthorized access by either the wrong devices or the wrong people. And this led to the development of a simple new model for access management which basically stated says that the right people should have the right act level of access to the right resources in the right context that's assessed continuously. Meaning we always keep on reviewing to make sure that everything's the way it's supposed to be. Everything's the, way, the same. And all of this had to be done with the least friction possible because while we wanna make sure everything's secure, users really wanna make sure that everything is easy to do. They wanna be able to get into their network easily. They want to be able to get to their assets and their resources readily. And so has to be frictionless. Here we go. This gave rise to a change in the way we looked at devices and people and data assets and other objects. Uh, it used to be that the difference between a trusted object and an untrusted object was assessed at the network perimeter. That is to say, if it had the right IP address and if everything checked out technically, then it was trusted. Otherwise, it was untrusted. Unfortunately, that's kind of like the castle and moat approach, right? So if you've ever built a castle, you know that the first thing you wanna do is to put a moat around it so that it's hard for anybody to get in unless you want them to. And if you recognize them, if you know who they are, you'll drop the drawbridge and they'll be able to get in, no problem. But that moat created a nice layer of protection. Well, the digital equivalent of that is the firewall that you put up between the internet and your internal network. The internet interpreted all those IP addresses, determined which ones should be allowed through and which ones should be kept out. And by the way, vice versa, which ones should be kept in and which ones should be allowed out as well. So you had protection both ways, but again, this proved to be insufficient over time. We needed a new way to make sure that everybody was who they said they were before we let them add our network. So we had to figure out a way to provide a platform upon which we could trust each other. It was all supposed to be built on trust. Now, if you know, think about the word trust, those of you who remember our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, he loved to say trust, but verify. Trust, but verify. Sounded great, right? We take that a step further. And what we say is never trust, always verify. Never trust anything. Nothing is what it says it is until you've proven that it is what it says it is. Now, this was a way of achieving a certain level of trust, that level being zero, zero trust. Okay, if we embark from zero trust, we trust nothing and we examine everything. We verify everything. So whenever someone or something tries to connect to our network, we're skeptical about who it is and what it is, so we prove it to ourselves. Zero trust was defined for us by a gentleman by the name of John Kinderbach. John was working at uh, Forrester at the time, and he basically said, look, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna define your what he called your protect surface. I call it your threat surface. What do you need to protect? What are the objects that are out there? Um, then where's the data going? 
How does data move from one object to another object, from a server to another server, so forth, or user? Um, how does that system work? Once you've done that, now you start to architect the environment so that it works more efficiently, putting the controls as close as possible to the threat surface, for one thing, so that you eliminate latency. You can solve problems more quickly. And he was very fond of the idea of creating micro perimeters, places where you could continuously check everything before it got through. Now we create our zero trust policy. Uh, he suggests using the Kipling method. Rudyard Kipling loved to approach everything by asking who, what, when, where, why, and how, the Ws. And so he adopted that for the examination of a network and the data running on that network to create a zero trust policy, which is in turn enforced by a variety of products, which we'll review in a moment. Um, finally, he stressed the importance of continuous monitoring and maintenance of the environment. Uh, there's all kinds of wonderful telemetry equipment out there. There's great artificial intelligence and machine learning software that can help us. All kinds of analytics software. And <clears throat> once we've used it to gather the information, the best thing we can do is automate responses to it automate the responses because the more we use automation, the faster the resolutions are and the more gratified and satisfied our users are. So Kindervad said that everything begins in the middle with identity security because we're going to qualify everything based on identity. Uh, then we worry about the security of our data. Then we worry about the security of the applications using our data and the devices that are running those applications. And finally, the network that all of this is running on. So Kindervog told us, begin by assessing everything. Know exactly what you have in your current state. An inventory of all your devices, all of your endpoints, all of your applications, workloads, everything. Use communities. Then start to plan your initiatives. What are you going to do to move to a zero trust environment? And while you're doing that, pay close attention to the interdependencies between things. Things can either be tightly coupled or loosely coupled. If they're loosely coupled, changing something on one part doesn't necessarily affect the other parts. And that is better. That is less vulnerable. So we want to try to limit the interdependencies, but be aware of them so we can handle them properly. And of course, assess all of our possible risks and figure out how to mitigate each of them. So that was the general approach to zero trust. And then he, Kindervad told us to create a roadmap, a roadmap that begins with identity, follows on with workloads, the devices, the networks, the people, the culture of those people, and finally the data. What's your roadmap for laying out where all of this is going to be? Forrester totally agreed with their former employee, saying that a detailed roadmap is vital to achieving zero trust. <coughs> Excuse me. And so they described the zero trust roadmap in much the way that Kindervog did. Begin with identity, workloads, devices, networks, people, culture, and data. Let's take a quick tour of that, beginning with identity. We'll be using identity and access management systems, IAM systems, to manage and govern all of our identity control. Um, by knowing who someone is and what device they're using, we can then grant them access uh, to whatever they should have access to. Um, this begins with automated onboarding. Uh, so that you have the same process every time you bring a new employee on. So you get them into your identity and access management system and your directory management, your, your naming directory management and so forth. Um, you also need to automate your offboarding. When somebody comes on, you wanna make sure they have a great first day uh, experience, that they get everything they need right away and they're ready to go to work. They don't sit around waiting for things. When they leave, you wanna make sure they're gone. 
and they don't have access to your network a minute beyond the moment they walk out the door. Many companies have discovered quite the opposite. They have people who left long ago who are still able to access their network and that's damaging. Everybody should by now be using multi-factor authentication. It's a simple, simple thing that combines something the user knows, their password, with something the user possesses, like their mobile phone, on which they get a six-digit code to add to their password to gain access. So multi-factor authentication is a must at this point. Giving people conditional access is a must. Uh, you don't need to give people access to anything they're not going to use. So if somebody in the sales department is not going to get access to accounting records or design records or manufacturing records and vice versa. Many companies have chosen to use a single sign-on platform so that people don't end up writing their passwords on sticky notes and putting them under their keyboard or, God forbid, in front of the monitor. Um, too many people doing it. Too many people still using the word password as their password uh, is very, very vulnerable. And all of this speaks to an overall directory management strategy and directory management platform. Fortunately, today's directory management doesn't care if it's on-prem or cloud. It will give you management over the entire environment, even if it's hybrid. Workloads. The magic word here is visibility. You want to make sure you have total visibility of every resource on your network. And you want all of that visibility in context. You want to know where that, that resource is, what it's being used for, who's using it, using what applications, how often. Is, I mean, there's plenty of information you want so that you're sure you know exactly what's happening with each resource. You want to make sure, by the way, to save yourself some time and effort, to use role-based access control in your roadmap to zero trust. Uh, RBAC is great. If you have a thousand users and you have to make a change in somebody's secure, in security for everybody, that's a thousand places you have to stop and make the change. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to do something that's that repetitive and that tedious. With role-based access control, you have everybody arranged in groups. So let's say you end up with 10 groups of about 100 people each. You go to each of the 10 groups, make the change, and all the people in each group will get the change. I'd rather do 10 than do 1,000. Use your own numbers to imagine just how bad it can get. Also, we're seeing a major shift from using best-of-breed tools to using best of platform. Uh, find a platform that really, really works for you, that you're really comfortable with, that does all the things you needed to do. And the good news is it's unified. The tools are all over the place. You don't know it. You have to learn each tool. If you're using 10 tools, that's 10 trainings and 10 support agreements. And who, you know, how many people are going to know that tool? If somebody leaves and they're the only one who knows the tool, you're up the creek. So is tools is not necessarily the best strategy. From a corporate standpoint, we prefer to use best of platform. The devices themselves, again, visibility. You have to be able to see every device that's on your network. I've been in so many environments where IT managers were shocked to find out about devices that were connected to the network that they knew nothing about. Every device has to get authorization before it's allowed to access. This way, you do know because you've had at least one point of contact with every device that has joined the network. There are also devices that don't have users. As way out at the edge of the network, you have IoT devices like sensors and switches and other controls. There's no user involved. It's just the device sitting out there on the edge, connected back, you know, they're, they're, they, they vary widely in how well they secure themselves and how well they handle power and how well they handle everything. You've got to make sure that every one of those devices is hardened sufficiently to make sure nobody can connect to your network through them. Yes, people have been known to connect 
to a network through a sensor or a switch or a control sitting way out there on the edge of the network. So those have got to be adequately hardened. And of course, you want to be using mobile device management to manage all of your devices. Most especially, you want to be sure you're managing patch and update, right? Not every patch should be applied. You have to make that determination. No patch should be applied directly by a user. You're asking for trouble when you do that. No security update should be affected by a user. That should be centralized. That should be under your control. So in terms of the devices, you need to keep control over them. You need to monitor them, know where they are. If they get into trouble, you need to be moving on resolving that trouble even before the user detects the problem. They're all going to connect to a network, and you have to have visibility of every device connected to that network. Every infrastructure device, switches, routers, modems, you name it, you need to be able to see it and make sure it's performing properly at the core of the network as well as out at the edge. Now, the core of the network in, in most cloud instances is not very reachable for you, but there are some things you can control, and you should control them. At the edge, a lot more control falls to you. And so you need to keep a good close eye on your edge infrastructure and make sure that everything's connected properly. All devices are properly hardened. Nobody is compromising any of your devices and they're all doing their job. Uh, as Kindervog told us, segment your network as logically as you possibly can. It is easier to control and manage a group of smaller segments than it is to try to take on a massive single network. So segmentation is a very good, very positive thing for you. Uh, if you do that, be sure to redefine your boundaries on a regular basis. Uh, not for nothing, but the business changes. You need to make sure that your segmentation continues to be aligned to the business and make use where you can of dynamic VLANs. Uh, a virtual LAN gives you control over each group's local area network, and that is way better than expecting them to control them. That's not going to happen. Finally, whatever platforms you choose, choose a platform that not only helps you find a problem and identify what it is, but also immediately gives you access and the tools to fix it. Today, users expect that when a problem is identified, it gets fixed right then and there. You don't have any time to delay. And there are platforms that support that extraordinarily well. Now we finally get to people. People, as we said before, want everything to be secure, but frictionless. They want it to be easy to access, but it's got to be secure. For every user, apply a policy of least privilege. Don't give them access to anything they don't need. They'll thank you because they'll be saved harmless from anything that goes wrong with any of those other resources. There is a movement to retire the concept of a password completely. Microsoft announced on this, that'd be two years ago, three years ago. Uh, still hasn't happened. But ultimately, with all of the multi-factor authentication development we see going on, there will come a point in time when people won't be able to use password as their password anymore, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or anything like that. Uh, they won't use a password at all. They'll simply use multi-factor devices to help them log into their network. Remember also that you can't depend just on digital control. That is to say, the most popular exploit in the wild today is ransomware. There are more incidents of ransomware than any other kind of exploit. Ransomware begins with a phishing email. Phishing email shows up in somebody's inbox. It looks genuine. It looks like it comes from their company or their bank or their lawyer or somebody reputable and somebody trustworthy. Uh, but the fact is it's not. It's a fake. It's a very good fake. They use all the right colors. They use all the right typography. Everything is looks exactly like it would if it came from the real thing. Somewhere on that email, there's a link that they're asked to click or a, a, an attachment they're asked to open. And when they do, they open the gates to Hades. 
everything starts coming through. Data gets appropriated, it gets corrupted, it gets encrypted, um, devices are exploited. Uh, you've given an open door to the bad actors to do whatever it is they want to do. And it's really an innocent action. You thought it was real. And you had every reason to think it was real. This is why training on ransomware is so critical because it is so difficult sometimes to identify a phishing email. Engineers who know their stuff tell us when they're talking about the portion of the network that's hardest for them to manage, it is that portion that exists between the keyboard and the chair, PEPCAC, uh, the user. The user is the hardest thing for them to manage, not because the user has bad intentions, but because users are people. They're subject to emotions. They are subject to mood. They are subject to misinformation. The device does what it's told consistently, constantly. It does what it's told. People make decisions for themselves. And therefore, that is one area in which you've got to be extraordinarily careful to put up as much of a defense as you possibly can. Uh, people are your greatest threat as well as your greatest asset. And then finally, the data. The data is what it's all about. You must have visibility of all of your data assets. You must know the value of each of your data assets. Otherwise, you could end up spending more on a data asset than that asset is worth. So you don't want to do that. Uh, by the same token, you may insufficiently protect highly valuable data assets, and that can be ruinous. You must maintain, this is no longer a should, this is a must. Everybody probably maintains encryption of data as it's in transit from place to place. But you must also encrypt data when it's at rest in storage. There are people attacking your storage. They will get in. And if they get in and they steal your data, when it's encrypted, they stole nothing. Because without the key, they can't get at the data. So even if it's in cloud storage, encrypt it and don't give your cloud provider the key. They don't need it. They don't care about the payload. They just care about the packets. And so data encryption in transit and at rest. And maintain a central directory of all data assets so you can always determine the current state of any data asset, where it is, what it's currently worth, who's using it, for what purpose, on what application, so forth and so on. Bottom line, what I'm saying to everybody is know your data. Know your data because losing or having corrupted uh, any worthwhile data asset is a career changing opportunity. <laughs> it's a, a career changing challenge. And of course, as Scott Becker will tell you, uh, everybody loves bacon and everybody loves data. That's why data is the new bacon. Everybody wants their data. Right, Scott? Okay. <laughs> now let's go back to our new threat surface where we have all of our users. And um, talk about how we protect, protect that. Um, it might be helpful to look at one of the nodes. Here's a node. Yeah, it looks like a house, right? Well, that's exactly what it is. All of your people are working at home. They're working in their house or their apartment or what have you. And if they're connected to the internet, they probably are using residential quality internet access, which is okay. And they're protecting themselves with a residential quality firewall which is okay. Is it sufficient for you to have your corporate data in there? Absolutely not. So these things won't work. So we have to get rid of them, they're gone. And instead we could, if we wanted to, put an, indus an industrial strength firewall at every location and connect them using industrial level internet access. If we have a couple of locations, a couple of people working from home, that's okay, we could probably do that. 
If we have a hundred people, uh, that's getting expensive. Thousand people, that's just about prohibitive. Ten thousand people, forget it. Beyond the expense of buying ten thousand industrial strength um, firewalls, there's the idea of managing and maintaining all of them. Uh, it, it would be horrendous. And so that is just not the solution. What we've come up with as a solution instead is called SASE, Secure Access Service Edge. Okay, with a Secure Access Service Edge, we combine the protocols that control your network with the protocols that control your security, and we manage them as one. So your software-defined wide area network control is here. Um, all of your you know, WAN optimization information is here. Um, providing network as a service and content management and so forth. That's all here. We also have on the security side, all of your network security controls, all of your zero trust network uh, administration controls and your firewall um, is it's all being provided here. And the important point, well, let's take a look before we even get to the important point, let's take a look at the protection SASE offers. They include application identification and protection, intrusion protection, so if anybody's trying to get in, SASE will stop them. Data loss prevention. So if you think data is leaking out of somebody's location, it will prevent it from getting out onto the internet where it can be accessed. Of course, malware detection, viruses, worms, trojans, and so forth. Uh, a web proxy to prevent bad traffic from getting to the actual user, it gets stopped by the proxy. Advanced threat protection of all kinds and more and more being developed over time. SASE is delivering more and more kinds of protection. Um, and most important, it's as a service. The firewall is as a service. And as a matter of fact, all of it is delivered as software as a service from the cloud. So you're not putting any hardware at each location. You're not touching those locations other than to connect to them. SASE protects all of it from your centralized remote location without having to go visit 1,000 or 10,000 locations. This gives you visibility of all your network assets and all your users. So that's exactly what you need. It's exactly what you get. And having visibility also suggests, and it's true, that you get centralized control of all of your sites. So if a user calls you with a problem, you can reach right into them through SASE and help them do what they need to do. Basically, this says <coughs> users can securely access your network from anywhere. OK. <clears throat> This brings us to the point where we want to do what we said in the title, architect the enterprise for remote work, remote offices, and cloud data. And so we're gonna build a little bit of the roadmap that uh, Kindervox suggested, uh, starting with an assessment of your current state. This is a comprehensive inventory of literally everything that's on your network or in your network, workloads, data assets, the user communities, everything. You need a complete inventory of everything. Once you have that and you come to understand it, you can start to define the desired future state. What do you want to be on the other end when you're finished making your changes? Which of your workloads is going to go where? You have so many choices. Where are you going to put them? Uh, where are you going to store and secure all your data assets? And how are you going to monitor those? And how will users access everything securely, but frictionlessly? <laughs> OK, next step, how are you going to control user access? Whether a user is mobile, in the office, or at their home, you need to maintain control and, over access for all users. They all have to be tested and verify themselves before they ever get access to anything. You'll use identity and access management with multi-factor authentication 
and password management, sorry about that, password management, so that you constantly have them changing their passwords and using complex passwords, as long as we're still using passwords, and device control, network access control, to make sure that devices are what they say they are with the capabilities they need to have to get on your network. Now, finally, you get to choosing clouds. Uh, and when you're choosing clouds, you know, big consideration is cost. Uh, now that you can go multi-cloud, you can compare and contrast the cost of a given VM between any of the different cloud providers and pick the one that gives you the best service at the lowest price. That will change every day. It changes constantly. So you have to stay on top of it. You're also going to want to look at capacities. What kind of configurations can you get at a lower rate? from each cloud vendor and what services are available. There are thousands of services available from each of the hyperscaler cloud providers, the big guys. Um, some of them are named the same, but they're completely different services. Some of them are the same service, but they're named completely differently. It's very confusing and you have to do your homework. You have to look at the service itself, not just the name of it, and come to know exactly what it is before you decide to add it into your environment. I mentioned that the prices are constantly changing. There are constantly special deals. There are constantly promotions. Uh, all of it is improving the environment. God bless the competition has all the hyperscalers and the smaller clouds, you know, working feverishly to make cloud services better all the time but you need constant cloud cost control to keep track of all those changes and take advantage of as many of them as possible, which means you need to develop a, a superior procurement strategy. And how are you gonna keep track of everything? How are you gonna buy? Um, how are you gonna make sure that you've got the best price at all times? Which means you're gonna to have to track all those changes. You're gonna to have to have a close eye on every one of the cloud services that you use and make sure that you're getting the best of breed from all of them, uh, no matter how much that changes over time. You're also gonna need to do extensive resource mapping, what goes where. We've been talking a lot about data security, and I'll just remind you, you can't be reminded enough, it, it, encryption at rest as well as in transit, and a great backup strategy. A great backup strategy is more than worrying about um, having the data backed up. It's, wor it, it's a security measure. Your best security measure against ransomware, the most popular threat, is having a backup of the data. This way, if they get in and they encrypt your data and they offer to unencrypt it or de-encrypt it, um, decrypt it for, for a large fee, you don't have to pay that fee. You simply restore your backup and tell them to go pound sand, but nicely so they don't get upset and attack you again. Network security. All your data rides on the network, so you have to be sure you're, con you're securing every endpoint, every connection to the cloud, and every connection inside the cloud. These all must be carefully, carefully protected. Also, you want to provide for communications and conferencing, right? You want to provide a collaboration platform. This way, all of your users can connect with each other from wherever they are, see each other, speak with each other, and work on documents together so that they don't have to travel and they don't have to pass things along. They can do it in group rather than one after another after another. When they do it in serial like that, that could take weeks. When they do it all at once in a, in a collaborative video conference, it gets done that day. So you vastly accelerate the process by using a collaboration platform. Your communications will probably be based on unified communications as a service delivered from the cloud. Uh, these are extraordinary services that uh, formerly everybody thought they were just a good replacement for PBX. They're much more than that today. They can be the central hub of all of your communications and all of your systems control as well. So you know, do some deep dives into UCAS and make sure you've developed an extremely tight support strategy. The last thing you want 
our users to be to become frustrated. Um, there's nothing worse than an unsatisfied user, because if you want to have a great customer experience, you first have to have a great employee experience. Uh, you don't want an unhappy employee connecting with customers. And finally, we talk about replacing the farmer shadow. Uh, the farmer shadow is, you know, <laughs> is non-existent, but people believe it's a real thing. So we're going to use workflow automation. So everybody checks in and checks out for everything that they're doing. This makes it better, better to have those users working at home because now suddenly you're collecting data about when they started working and when they finished working. You can see how long things take them and how much faster they get over time or how fast they are compared to their peers in the team. Which is your fastest at getting something done? Which is your best at getting something? You have data to back that up. So workflow automation is a boon, not a requirement. Of course, if you're going to use it, you're going to have to be ready to measure results by, I'm sorry, measure everything by results, not by the clock. It doesn't matter if they work from 9 to 5. Some of them are going to be working from 7 to 8, 7 to 8 p.m., 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. because of their commute. Um, they're replacing their commute with work. God bless them. So measure their results, not the clock. If the work you need done gets done, that's a win. Also, you want to make sure that you have a great socialization strategy. And we're going to just touch on that before we go. If you have people working from home, take good care of them at home. Help them prepare a great home office. Okay, that includes a roomy work surface, a not too comfortable chair, because if it's too comfortable, they'll fall asleep, good lighting to protect their eyes, a fully configured computer so they can do their work, some kind of headset, a soft phone, a mobile phone, what have you, good internet access, perhaps a printer, but the most important tool that they can possibly have is that one that the big arrow is pointing at in the back, a door, a door to the room so that they can have fewer distractions and a little more peace and quiet. Those of you who have worked out in an open space in your den or your living room, you know what I'm talking about. Once you move into a room behind a door, you'll never go back. What I'm saying is manage the whole person. Nothing is more important than managing the whole person, their, their emotional life, their interpersonal life, their professional life, everything. See them as people. It's never been more important, but it's also never been more challenging. Also, strongly suggest you see your company as a community. Okay, you want to preserve this, the, the water cooler gathering. It may look more like this, where everybody's on a phone or a laptop or a tablet, but that's fine. Just make sure you have parties like this on a regular basis where people can gather and be people together, talk with each other, be, stay part of the company, if you will. So treat your people as people. So my key takeaways are very quick, very brief. Plan first, then deploy. Don't try to build it step by step and make mistakes and go back. That will cost you. Trust automation to track your results and your outcomes and stop worrying about the clock. It's not your problem anymore. Never trust, always verify. Can't say that often enough. And the most important thing is to connect and keep your people connected. Okay, keep your people connected. You know, keep that esprit de corps, if you will. If you do that, all of the rest of it has a great chance of working very, very well. And Scott, uh, I believe next up is questions and answers, or you know, it looks like we may not have time. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. We've probably got time for one or two. And, uh, and sir, I couldn't get off mute there. I, I do appreciate the bacon slide. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but your, your one thing um, that, that I really love is, is that idea of a door. As, as somebody who's worked at home for a long time, um, the mm -hmm. door is, is a huge tool. It, it's really something Absolutely. important to think about. Um, so we did get a question from from Heath pretty early on, and, and you mentioned this a couple of times. I'll give you one more 
uh, opportunity to give it a crack at it based on on Heath's uh, note. So he says, saw an article at CNET this morning that they expect the trend for 2023 to be businesses pushing for a return to the office and employees revolting against the same. Why are businesses so adamant about forcing employees into a tox toxic relationship at, even after three years of evidence that remote work is a viable alternative? Um, okay. Anything I'm, else you I'm want gonna to say? Give you a, I'm going to give you a horrible answer, but okay. nothing is more nothing is more resistant than ignorance. Um, mm. There are still a lot of managers, a lot of executives who believe that they've got to be in the office, they've got to be in their seat, they've got to punch a time clock. Um, it's not it's not universal yet. So there are going to be companies and, you know, the statistics are, are astounding. And I wish I brought them with me, but um, you've heard of the great resignation or the big quit. That's a real thing. Yep. More than 50% of employees who tried to continue working at a company after they said, nope, you got to come back. They left. They found a better job elsewhere where they could work from home. More than half. Now you think about that. These ignorant managers are shooting themselves in the foot because they're losing their good people. And there are currently 4 million open job requisitions in the IT industry worldwide. 800,000 of them are here in the States. So with that many people looking for a job, it's not likely that the manager who loses somebody is going to find somebody all that quickly to replace them with. So. I think that the, the, the motivating factor, Heath, is ignorance. These people are not looking at things for what they are. Uh, and at some given point, they'll either lose their job or they'll see the light um, <clears throat> because this is here to stay. <clears throat> we, are, we are more about, there's a concept called placelessness. Uh, the more we move forward, the more we seem to move to a place where it doesn't matter where you are. Nobody cares where you are. They just care that they can connect with you and communicate with you. A lot of people are getting used to talking to each other over video. Um, you know, I think it's going to change radically, but there's going to be plenty of people surveyed who still say, nope, they got to be in their chair. Um, yeah. I don't know what, you know, I think we just wait and see. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, Thanks for putting together a fantastic presentation, especially appreciated the uh, those checklists. I thought those were really valuable. Um, and, you know, as always, um, and, you know, really appreciate all your insights here, Howard. Thanks for being on. My pleasure. And now it is time for the prize drawing for the $300 Amazon gift card. And the winner is Mite Akdugan from California. So congratulations to Mite. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank our sponsors who made this event possible, Duo, Rubric, Nasuni, Palo Alto, and Okta. And thanks as always for attending and for your great questions. That concludes today's event. Have a great weekend.